Hey everybody, Red Mage here. Welcome back to the series where I go through different RPG products that I have and give them a quick flip through and review. In this one, I'm going to be going through three products by Goodman Games, which I just recently purchased. Three great resources and references for DMs who are preparing their campaigns and just want to add in some weirdness, some randomness, some wackiness. The first is the Monster Alphabet, an A to Z reference for classic monster design. The second is the Cthulhu Alphabet, which is an A to Z reference for Lovecraftian mythos design, which is, I feel, fitting as we're getting close to Halloween. And then the third is the Adventurer's Almanac by Michael Curtis, which is an entire year's worth of adventure, um, complete with magical items, interesting personalities, strange festivals, and dangerous sites to explore. System neutral. Uh, all three of these are system neutral, but they all do... Um, well, they're, they're Goodman games. They're DCC primarily, but, you know, you, you can... You can the, the tone, I would say, is, is DCC rather than anything else. So let's just go through them. This first one is 90 pages. Uh, it's great. The art is just incredible. It's that classic, gonzo, wild DCC uh, Goodman Games art with, you know, Stefan Poag and uh, Errol Otis and just art from classic, uh, you know, <laughs> weird monster uh, design uh, artists and all that stuff. So here's the monster alphabet. It's the same as the uh, the dungeon alphabet, which I have reviewed before on the channel, in in that it has these you know breakdown of every letter with a couple categories, two or three sometimes, sometimes just one categories for each of these um, letters, and they relate to monsters and things like that. Here's a very strange, um, yeah, draw, die drop table, I think, or just a you know roll. You get the different. Um, kind of wings that a creature has, the number of horns that a creature has, uh, the kind of horns that it has. It just very weird, very weird stuff. Do a bunch of D6s or a bunch of D12s you could choose. And uh, it's just so bizarre. <laughs> uh, but then you get to the actual um, uh, the uh, actual book itself. And, and one of the things that it makes note on is the funky dice, which kind of DCC Goodman Games just leans into. If you don't have a set of funky dice, there are adaptations you can use. But... Uh, but I think a lot of us have the funky dice at this point. Um, a is for aquatic. You get a bunch of different kinds of subtables and interesting aspects for aquatic creatures. A is also for android. Six fantastical androids for your campaign world. You get A is also for armor. And 12 unusual armor types. B is for blood. The, I, I think of these books as basically not necessarily something you're going to keep with you at the table and roll, although you might. Nor is it going to be something necessarily that you keep open when you're deciding to do a, an adventure design prep and you have the table that you need exactly for the thing that comes up. It's not only really that either. I think of this book as inspiration, right? So you're reading through it, you're rolling on tables for fun, and you're coming up with these things and you go, oh, I need to find a way to put this into my game. And then you do. Or you, or you write up a little block or an adventure or, a, or an idea based on what you've rolled or read, and then later on in your prep, you add that in. I think that's the way to do it. You have like inspiration sessions, right? That's what I try to do is I'll read through my books for like inspiration sessions where I'm not planning for anything in particular. I'm just trying to imbibe inspiration. And I think a book like this is perfect for that. 12 party wiping breath attacks. That's a great one. Uh, celestial, seven celestial missions, seven celestial qualities. I like that they put it at seven, which is cool. The holy number as they say. Um, the number of virtues and vices, for example. Um, C is also for construct. Ten animated or constructed threats. That's great. Great art throughout. I mean, again, the art alone is worth the inspiration. It's worth the price of admission. Fantastic. C is also for crossbreed. Polymorph polymorphistic donor species and additional traits. That's great. D is for dragon, because of course it is. got to have a, a dragon in the monster alphabet. Ten Twisted Dragon Templates. You have the Disabled Dragon. The Prehistoric Dragon. The Insect Dragon. The Double Dragon. <laughs> double Dragon. That's great. E is for Eyeball. A Pack of Pitiless Peepers. Great piece of art there. That looks... Yeah, that looks so good. Um, e is for also for like Extra Planar. Eight... Extraordinary Extra Planar Endowments. F is for Flame. F is also for Frost. G is for Geese. I think it's how you say that. I've never actually known how you say that, but I've always said Geese. G is also for Giant. 
H is for Horde, I is for Infernal, etc. You get the point. This is a fantastic, fantastic book with tons and tons of art. Oh, man. Tons of art. Almost on every page, there is some fantastic piece of art. And there's incidental art on every page that doesn't have it. That doesn't have a, a, a regular piece, like little bits. And I think it's basically all of them. Um, L is for Lore. L is also for Lycanthropy. Great. M is for Mimic. So here's an example of a table of a page that doesn't have art. It stands out because it's one of the few. But even here, you get a massive set of tables, so it's useful. And you also get that beautiful M at the top of the page. So it's not like it's ever a wasted page. You're like, oh, that's boring. You never get that. Or like this page where the table is sort of set into a piece of art with a little guy at the bottom here. Fantastic. I highly recommend you guys check out the Monster Alphabet. Uh, the A to Z reference for classic monster design. If you want to make your monsters a little bit weirder, if you want to take things up a notch, there are other monster books out there. The Monster Overhaul is a fantastic one. And the ideas and inspiration in the Monster Overhaul, don't get me wrong, are just incredible. That's the best monster manual I have. This isn't a monster manual. This is inspiration. This is out of left field, gonzo, wacky design that's going to make you go, whoa, I never thought of that. Uh, and I think that's really cool. Okay. Uh, the next one, as I said, is the Cthulhu alphabet. It's the same idea, same formatting, but focused on Lovecraft and Lovecraftian designs. And I think that's really good. Really, really good. The art is just as horrifying, just as, you know, uh, <laughs> just as disturbing, perhaps more so. Um, a is for angles. It's interesting because here you have like almost a treatise on the idea of angles. But then you have angular adventures, <laughs> which is kind of funny. A local inn has a reputation for being haunted by strange sounds and presences. Eventually, the disturbances are pinpointed to a single bedroom where the walls and corners are slightly off. A past occupant has etched curious mathematical markings in one corner of the oddly angled room. What manifests via the marked corner to those intrepid enough to spend a night in the haunted room? That's a great idea. And there's D12 table of haunted adventures. By the way, this, this PDF is 114 pages. Oh, look at that horrible... Thulu creature. That's Peter Mullen. I like Peter Mullen a lot as an artist. Yeah, I'm one of the book, one of the big pieces that I really liked in my um, um, in my did, uh, folder. My my design binder is from Peter Mullen. B is for books. Oh, that's so good. So useful. I always like books. Books, books, books. The effect on the reader, right? What is the horrible Lovecraftian effect on the reader for reading the book? What type of book? What's the subject matter? What's the general description? Uh, what's the, uh, yeah, yeah, and then what's the effect on the reader? Um, you can create this unique book in your in your game. Now, uh, as you can see, this isn't like, for example, subject matter is harder to read. It's not super clear, and that's what I mean. This isn't used, this isn't for quick use at the table. This isn't probably even for, I would say, use during prep. This is for inspiration. You read through this book on your own time, especially if you're going to run a certain kind of campaign, like in this case it'd be like a Lovecraftian or Thulu campaign, or you want to add in Lovecraftian elements, and you just write down the things that are interesting to you, and they put it in a PDF, or you put it in a file, put it in a Word doc, just write it in your binder, and then later when you go to make your actual adventures, you add those in at particular places. Here are some detailed books. Aha, C is for cultists. And it has a great quote here. They worshipped, so they said, the great old ones who lived ages before there were any men and who came to the young world out of the sky. Those old ones are gone now, inside the earth and under the sea, but their dead bodies have told secrets, had told their secrets in dreams to the first men who formed a cult which had never died. The Cult of Cthulhu. Table A, Table B, for the kind of cult, the cult personality. That's so good. What are the abilities of the cult? What is the elder god that they worshipped? Thalpa. Shubnigarath. Yig. Bast. Sothuga. Sothugua. These are all good. Most of these are from the uh, the actual mythos. I think they're all maybe from the mythos. Haster, Yog, Sadoth, Glaki. Yeah, I think these are from the mythos. I don't recognize some of them, but it's possible that they're in others that I don't know. Shogoth, the god in the box, the black big black thing. That's really creepy. I like that. Ooh, that's a good. D is for deep ones. A dozen demonic deep one plots. E is for elder thing. 
bunch of tables for the elder thing. F is for forbidden. Now you'll notice that there's a little bit less, I would say, art. I, again, not that there's no art at all. It's almost on every page. But there are, it's just less, it seems to me. There are more full pages of tables and, uh, and more incidental detail art in corners and things. Wow, that's a good piece right there. That's a good one. Then in the other book, oh, H is for Hastur, the unspeakable one. Is Hastur the king in yellow? Yes. Oh, his emissary is the king in yellow. Yeah. I don't know if you guys ever watched True Detective, but when they started to, t started to talk about the yellow king in True Detective, I was like, oh my gosh. I was so excited. Uh, it didn't fully play out. It had a little bit towards the end. There was a little bit of that supernatural. And I thought that was cool. I wish they'd leaned way more into it. Um, but I thought that was cool. Signs of entropy. Ithaqua. So it's great. Obviously, obviously it's great. Um, it's a different kind of book than the first one. It's going to be more specific. And again, the incidental art is still here. It's still inspirational. It's just not as ubiquitous as the first book. So I could see where you might not get this one if you're, first of all, not into Cthulhu, but if you're also just not as, um, you know, it, it's just less useful in terms of that, I would say, influence and inspiration, which the Monster Alphabet has. But it is still very, very good. I like Cthulhu. I, like, I love the uh, mythos of H.P. Lovecraft. I, I read it a lot, at least around Halloween. <laughs> and I think it's a fantastic tone to add into a campaign. I almost always have something like uh, the great old ones in my campaign world, something like these deep, dark cults that have these really more, not demonic, but almost beyond demonic, right? Um, the other side of hell sort of thing, the abyss, the void. They're there somewhere. Um, and uh, in my in my main world, the way that I've explained, uh, there's this sort of this thing called the empty throne, which is when the gods first awoke, when the divine beings first awoke, they looked around and they realized none of them had created. So they looked to the throne, but it was empty. There was no one there. And they didn't know whether that means that there had never been someone there, that there had never been a god who created, or whether he had left or what. And so many other gods say, no, no, it's about claiming it. And so they start to the war amongst themselves. Some of them say, no, no, we have to but we have to uphold an order to the throne and we have to wait and be patient and be good and, and create a good order of things. That's sort of the way I view chaos and law in my world is sort of the chaotic gods are the ones who are like, no, we got to seize the throne. And some of them are crazy. Some of them are wild. Some of them are, you know, less wild, <laughs> neutral or things like that. Then there are those who want to uphold the order in different ways. But then there are the gods who looked at the empty throne and went mad. And they exiled themselves into the farthest avoids of the abyss to, to not you know to not know to not have to see and those are the mad gods those are the ones that you know in fifth, fifth edition warlocks for example the great old ones those were the gods that they worshipped or that they served you know the uh, the, the patrons that they served but uh, I, I still try to include that idea in my worlds even if there aren't warlocks in Shadow Dark or games that I play now so M is for madness great Great art here. <laughs> oh yeah, that's like the um, uh, what's that? Uh, the uh, the cask of Amontillado or Amontillado, um, you know, masoning the guy up in the wall. That's pretty creepy. I like that. So anyway, you guys get the point of this one too. Emma's from Miskatonic University. Uh, a really really good. And Ennis for Nylar Thotep. Nylar Thotep. He's a great guy. <laughs> the Cthulhu Alphabet. Very cool. Very, very cool. And uh, highly recommend both of these, both the Cthulhu Alphabet and the Monster Almanac. Uh, the, uh, and the Monster Alphabet. Now, the final one I wanted to cover is the Adventurer's Almanac. This is different than the other two. The other two are, you know, alphabetical rundown of, of different random tables and things like that. This one is 114 pages, but it's much more... Basically, what it does is it takes a month and it, and it divides uh, into months. The whole book is divided into months. And then it gives you a bunch of ideas based on the month. And it gives you ideas based on the day of the month and stuff like that. So here's what I mean. Um, you'll see, it's also got great art. It's also got great inspiration and lots of tables. But um, the way it works is you have a calendar format. So you have the day's name, you have the numerical date of the day and the holiday which occurs, occurs on it, the phase of the moon and the day's equivalent in the Gregorian calendar. 
So you have that at the bottom too. And then you have feast days, festivals, and holidays. And then you have, uh, well, so here, for example, you have a random festival creation table. What's the festival event? You roll a d100 of, of the uh, festival event. And you have the astro astrological signs, which are associated with each of the months, or the birth months. And there are particular days, the day of the dragon and the day of the cicada, uh, which is the last of them. Okay, so here you go, hard frost. And you have each of the days uh, are, are named, if you're going to name them individually. So you have uh, rooster, ant, ox, donkey, shrew, reindeer, gnat, yak, pigeon, ice bear, etc. But then you have the number of the month, so the first of hard frost, the second of hard frost, the third of hard frost. You have the moon it's associated with and what day of the month uh, of the Gregorian calendar it corresponds to, right? So uh, lemming of hard frost is uh, January 12th. You get a description of hard frost and then you have some traits. So the sign, what, what those people who are born under it are known as, the day traits, their night traits, positive quirks and negative quirks. So if you want to really lean into that side of thing, you definitely can. But then you have random dates, events and adventure ideas for the month of hard frost with a D100 table. So you have things that are interestingly interesting and occurring in this month that are associated with everything we've just gone through. Interesting events, places and things. And, and so you have now more details. The Aurora Terribilis, the Crystal Wand, the Dead Moon Knight, the Icy Eerie. So essentially you have like seasonal ideas based on the kind of things that are happening in that month. February here, right? Uh, it's Shroud. But it's not quite February, right? Because you can see the first three days of the month come from, they're, they're still January from the Gregorian calendar. But it's still the early part of the year. And you have, again, things that are happening throughout the, the year. It's, it's, a, it's a calendar. You have those astrological shrines again, random dates, events, and adventure ideas. And then interesting events, people, places, and things for the month of Shroud. And it just goes through and tells you a bunch of good ideas, good events, people, places, and things that make sense with this time of year, with this month. And then you go, in, you know, wizardly death, <laughs> the strange demise of wizards. The powers that a mage commands are terrifying, and it is only normal that the true origins of these energies have long been speculated on by those without the ability to command them. Stories of sorcerers tapping into weird magical nexuses, making unholy deals with malignant spirits, or mastering fickle energy fields to produce magical effects are just some of the theories murmured whenever wizards are not around. Normal folk even suspect that wizards have a tentative control at best over the power they claim to command, and a mage's magic threatens to escape his control whenever he lets his attention lapse in the slightest. Unfortunately for all, there may be some truth to this speculation. When a whenever a wizard dies, be he a mighty magus or a mere apprentice, there is a chance the powerful forces he formerly commanded manifest in enigmatic ways, etc., etc. That's really cool, right? So a wizard has these, like, when he dies, boom, something crazy happens. Um, that's awesome. Gale home, great piece of art there. <laughs> Random dates, events, and adventure ideas in the month of Gale home. The crown of roaches. That's an interesting uh, thing for the month of Gale home. This coronet is a work of art, albeit an unsettling one. Fashioned from copper, the crown is adorned with fine filigree that gives the entire piece an insectile look. The smooth band resembles the carapace of a roach. Spikes and other protruding ornaments are done in the style of insect, insect legs and antennae, and when the light catches the crown just right, it shimmers with the iridescence of a beetle's wings. The crown of roaches was once the headpiece of the Insectrix, the high priestess of Autrog, lord of vermin and pests. Autrog is a repulsive deity who promises his downtrodden cult of beggars, cripples, and outcasts that a new day is coming when the last least of creatures will be raised up high. Autrog works his will through these cultists as well as nests, insects, invertebrates, rats, and other pestilent creatures. His doctrine is one of decay and infestation, and he gets no greater joy than watching the prestige of nobility and the comforts of civilization eroded by the work of his servants, both bipedal and many legged so noxious are his temples and worshippers, they are confined to the slums and shambles of cities, and even there, they must operate in secrecy, lest they be discovered and driven out. So then it talks about what the crown does, the powers of the crown, things like that. So you take this and add it into your world, great idea, great uh, inspiration, great artifact, and it would change your world, it would make things very, very interesting. All right, so Dragon Heat, which is the, the, the mating of dragons. <laughs> that reminds me of Guards Guards, which I just finished reading by Terry Pratchett. So good. If you guys have never read Guards Guards, you really should. Um, the Bloom, right? So once again, you get the idea here. Page after page of great ideas based on the month. Uh, this is a fantastic idea. I can't believe people haven't done this sort of thing before. And and so just the adventures, the artifacts, the kinds of things that are, are going to be tied into the into the 
time of year that you're looking at. So you're going to have winter events, spring events, summer events, but even more specific than that, right? April events, basically, and June events and August events, because June summer and August summer are very different kinds of summer, right? And so the sort of adventures, artifacts, creatures, places, things that are associated with that part of the year are going to be very different. Anyway, I think this is fantastic. The Adventures Almanac, I highly recommend you guys check it out. So I'll put links below to where you can get all three. The Adventures Almanac, the Cthulhu Alphabet, and the Monster Alphabet. All right, guys, that'll do it for this video. Hope it's been interesting, and I'll see you all in another one.